Welcome back everyone, Jonathan here with a brick. It's not far off a brick to be honest with you. This is a really hefty piece of kit. It looks a bit like a, a machine pistol, but actually, as far as I know, this was only ever made as a semi-automatic pistol. What is it? This is the Danuvia Forte. That probably isn't the Hungarian pronunciation because this is Hungarian. Uh, model VD01. A lot of the markings are visible on the side here. So we have the name of the name of the gun, or perhaps of the family of weapons. I don't know if this was intended to be a family of weapons. Only one type known. And then we have the serial number 00101, pretty low. Now, low serial numbers in this collection are not unusual at all. Uh, we often do have, if we're lucky, the first one ever made. Not in this case, but it is quite low. But that can indicate sometimes a low production run as well. Um, we'll come to that at the end. And then caliber 9mm Luger. Luger or Parabellum, same thing. The pistol was actually called the Parabellum pistol, um, hence 9mm Parabellum, 9 by 19 millimeters. And we also have the lo corporate logo for Danuvia with the country name Hungary in English as well. So a lot of information in just one little bit of the gun. You've probably spotted, might have, maybe even heard, the magazine. It's one of these helical magazines, so a spiral feed inside here. And so think of the, uh, the Russian PP-19 Bison, um, the American Calico, and those weird North Korean uh, AKs with gigantic 100 round helical, ma helical magazines on them that may or may not be real, no one's quite sure. Um, so it's something that designers keep coming back to. It has massive downsides in terms of engineering, making them work reliably. And inherently, just like any drum magazine, it makes the thing hefty. So this is, this is 2.4 kilograms empty, so it's quite a lump as it is, and 2.8 loaded with 33 rounds of 9mm ammunition, which this is inert ammunition, I hasten to add. But this is really the heart of the system. Um, there's nothing too unusual about this gun other than the magazine. And the only patent, which we can hopefully show you, the uh, drawing of at least, issued in or applied for in 1988, granted in 1989, is for the magazine. Everything else is fairly conventional, um, but with its own unique spin, which we'll have a look at in detail. The, the layout is, is clearly a little unusual. It's basically that of a, of a self-loading pistol, which it is, technically, um, with a obviously a pistol grip, quite a sculpted grip. So this is a cast metal trigger frame or lower receiver. I'm not actually sure on the alloy, to be honest with you. And then the upper receiver is, I don't know, like a like an Uzi on Ingram or something, sheet steel. Um, albeit without much in the way of reinforcing ribbing or anything. There's a bit here on either side, but it's actually pressed into the metal, not um, raised out of it, if that makes sense. Ejection port here in, that's oval. Um, you'll see, there's, well, you might see, and uh, we might be able to show you. There's another variant of this, and I'm unclear on the timeline, but it has every little detail is a bit different, and there's a reinforcement around this ejection port, uh, slightly di different shaped trigger guard. It's clearly the same basic design. It's either the original form of the gun, or more likely, a slightly developed form. Not entirely sure. If anyone does know, let us know. Um, but the version you'll see, if you look online, is this. In fact, there's even a um, Hungarian gun guy, I think his name is, has a video on YouTube of this actually shooting. Controls-wise, well, there's only really the safety. It's a pretty conventional um, applied safety, as we'd say in the UK. Just up and down. Not, not ambidextrous. Uh, it seems to be quite effective in that it blocks the sear inside here. The trigger mechanism, um, there's not much to see if you can get it out, uh, and I couldn't. Um, it's, it's really quite compact and simple, so that's not adding to the, to the weight. Most of the weight is in this bulky 
upper receiver, obviously the barrel. Um, this is a polygonal rifled Lothar Walther barrel, apparently. Uh, so mo most gun makers, firearms manufacturers these days do not make their own barrels and um, Danuvia were no exception. It'll be hard to show you the, the polygonal rifling. It is, as far as I can tell or, or see, it is somewhat like the uh, Generation 5 Glock rifling that's technically polygonal but is not obviously polygonal. If you don't know what I'm talking about with polygonal rifling, it's it actually, you find it on the old Lee Metford uh, British service rifle. So instead of having spiral grooves, well, broadly speaking, instead of having spiral grooves, you have a polygonal shape, a cross, cross section, and that rotates down the bore, if that makes any sense at all. Um, not all rifling has to be just cut grooves. It can just be a shape that grips the lead bullet that is rotated as you proceed down the ball. That's broadly what polygonal rifling is, and this has it. Um, advantages um, are debated back and forth. Um, it's easier to clean because you're not having to s essentially scrape the carbon out of the, the shoulders of those cut grooves if it's all smooth. It's like, think of it like smooth rifling. That's probably the simplest way to think of it. Is that, a, is that a, a relevant, of relevance in a, in a pistol? Probably not. Um, well, it's not, a, not not of relevance, but it's kind of it's not essential. Put it that way. There are plenty of manufacturers of pistols who do not use polygonal rifling. And we have some basic iron sights. They are well pretty standard for the for the late eighties, early nineties. Um, I'll try and show you those on camera. Not too remarkable. Pretty standard combat-esque sights. Uh, they are adjustable um, for windage and elevation though via a couple of screws. That one and the one below. So more adjustment than your typical um, pistol sight of the day, but not they're not hyper adjustable by any means. We have a bolt hold open, so let me, well let's pop off the, the magazine. So the magazine catches here. So really only, only three controls to worry about, the safety that I've shown you, the magazine catch that I've just demonstrated, and the cocking handles, which are either side. Pull those back, and the inert round that was in the chamber comes out, obviously. So we are happy that this is clear. I can also show you, there is actually another control, I'm lying to you, which is this button on top. And if we pull back those cocking handles and press down on that button, hey presto, the bolt is held open. It's a manual hold open device. There is no bolt release um, in common with, well, quite a few designs actually. You just have to pull back those ears and the bolt goes forward. The magazine, I think, is, is somewhat interesting in terms of, well, very interesting for the user because it's easy to load. So a lot of these, this, well, drum magazines generally have to be wound up. They have essentially a clockwork follower inside and you have to crank them up. Um, makes them easy to load as well, but adds to the complexity and potential for, for failure. This seems to me to be a very good helical magazine design, if you think that helical mag spiral magazines are a good idea at all, which is questionable, because you can just um, I could demonstrate by reinserting the round we've just ejected. Incidentally, these, these are British military drill rounds, so they have no primer, no content, and they have grooves. Some of the paint's worn off these, but grooves in them that are filled with red paint. Some of them are anyway. So we can be absolutely sure that these are inert rounds. But to load all you're doing, and this is the final round, this is the 33rd round, so it's as, as tough as it's ever gonna be to load this, push down, push back, and it's in. It's, no, it's easier to load than or as easy to load as any pistol magazine, but you get 33 rounds. Now, some of you are probably already saying, but why bother? You, I can get a 33 round Glock magazine. Well, you can, but to load that fully and easily, you really need a mag loader. This doesn't need a mag loader, so there's one advantage there. As you've seen already, it hooks in. You have a ledge here and a, harder to see, but there's a, a notch under the front here. 
and you hook that into there, locate it into place, and then obviously make sure it's clicked in and the magazine captures popped up. Uh, I've been taught to uh, always check once the magazine is clicked in to make sure it's not going to drop out and embarrass you when you pull the trigger. That's how it works. It's, it's quite straightforward. There is no butt stock. Um, now I've seen photos of a single point sling attached somehow. Um, I haven't figured out where that would be attached or if that's a different variant, but ours doesn't have a means of attaching a sling at all, which is a bit of a problem. Um, it's with 33 rounds in it, this thing is extremely front heavy and extremely heavy full stop. You can, of course, use a two-handed grip, which helps a lot. Some sources recommend holding the magazine. In fact, I believe there was even a sleeve created to help with that grip, because this is quite slick otherwise. And you can do the push-pull, either push forward with this hand, pull back with this hand, or the opposite, depending on your, your preference. Problem there is you've got a lot of leverage. Okay, so this is actually quite easy to field strip, so let's do that. So we'll pop the magazine back off, move that out of the way. And then our other button, so that's our hold open button there that we've already shown. And then there's another button here that we, it has a, or it's a sliding catch with a button. You press the button, you slide the catch forwards, and that should, and does allow you to pop off the top cover, which is a somewhat complex design because it incorporates the slider uh, for those ears, the cocking handle ears that you saw me manipulating there. And inside you can see it's a big old chunky blowback system. So there's no locking here. There's no, no bolt locking into place. That's obviously our recoil spring and guide rod. It's a little fiddly to um, get access to the bolt. So I'll try and show you, perhaps the overhead camera is best for this. So I'll try and show you this. We can pull back on these two. Incidentally, these, these two pegs locate um, into, the, into the cocking slide to allow it to operate. That's what those are for. So we pull back, get our fingers in here without ending up with um, forte finger. And we're under spring tension, so being careful not to let this brick of steel fly across the room or scratch the finish. Pop that out. There we go. I'm being more cautious than you would be in, uh, in real life. There's our breech block. Fairly simple, but you can see it's been, as well as all of the relieving on the underside to enable it to function and pick up a round and chamber it, and also accommodation for a sprung firing pin, which lives in the, in the, in the uh, breech block or bolt as well. That's the back of it where the, the hammer strikes. As well as all of that, it is also relieved on the sides. So this, this black strip here and on the other side, I'm sure you can see that's actually lower than the high points, if <laughs> you see what I mean. And that's just like the um, sand cuts on an FN FAL bolt or any other bolt or the Sten for that matter, where it has multiple diameters. So it's bearing on as little surface as possible, as little friction as possible. That's, that's the idea of that. So that's the bolt. The recoil spring and guide rod will pop out as well and we get a good view into the interior. Notice this great big thick white polymer block here. So a fair bit of buffering there to, to help not reduce recoil technically, but to reduce the um, muzzle flip essentially. Soften, smooth out the recoil. There's that tiny trigger mechanism pack in there pretty tiny and might be able to demonstrate on the overhead. So that's the hammer that I'm pressing on there. Straightforward pivoting hammer. And if I pull the trigger, it goes forward. So that's, that's the hammer there. Bit of additional mass on the side here. And that's actually where it, how it um, 
locks into the cocked position as well. So click, very simple. Fixed ejector, very similar to submachine guns, blowback submachine guns, which this kind of is, except that, as I say, as far as I know, they're all semi-automatic. Um, I suspect there would have been an automatic variant produced, but I, I haven't seen one or seen much evidence of one. And then the other thing of interest is the back end of our barrel. Um, I'm not going to attempt to, to remove that, but uh, you can see the feed ramp where the, round, the cartridges come up and are fed in. And that's about it. It's fairly straightforward, fairly simple. Um, we've only got one, so we, uh, we're not going to shoot it. But as I say, you can, uh, you can find footage of people shooting it. At the end of the day, it's a semi-automatic pistol. So it does the same thing as a Glock or a Beretta um, with a relatively high capacity and a lot of weight. OK, so back, all back together now. Um, now, we saw that, that fixed barrel inside the gun there. That, I think, is one of the reasons why the manufacturer claimed extremely high accuracy. That's what they, they said in the promotional material. Now, there are, there are points that would potentially support that. Um, as I say, fixed barrel, uh, precision made, Lothar Wolfer barrel, that's going to be inherently accurate as far as the barrel goes. And it is closed bolt operation. So though it's blowback operated, it's not slamming forward and disturbing your aim. So that's not uncommon with semi-automatic blowback designs to have the bolt start from the closed position. It's inherently more accurate in that respect. It also has a good trigger pull for a weapon of its type. Uh, the trigger is light enough to not disturb the aim. Um, it's not like a match grade pistol trigger or anything. And one, one other point that would be in favor of this suggestion is that the sights are really quite far apart. So you get less in the way of movement, relatively speaking. Uh, if sights are very close together, a small amount of movement translates to a lot of movement of the front sight. The further apart they are, the better the sort of um, inherent accuracy of the iron sights. Uh, now, this is a bit ahead of its time in that there is a dovetail for, I guess, a, a proprietary form of sight of some kind. Now, in the early 90s, there wasn't really much on the market that wouldn't greatly add to the weight and bulk of this thing. So I don't suppose um, there, there was much option there. Today, uh, and I believe this is still available in theory, um, you could obviously put a micro red dot on, that, on this thing and, and improve its effective accuracy that way. All of that said, I would struggle with the sheer weight of this thing. Um, it's, yes, it's it's, it might be inherently accurate, and I suppose in rapid fire, the weight of the thing would, would help, just like a, you know, some competition pistols have a muzzle weight to, to help keep the muzzle down. I don't know. Your mileage is going to vary on this one. Um, inherent mechanical accuracy, sure, but where the rubber meets the road, as it were, and, and the user is, is firing off shots with it, it's debatable. Now, I haven't mentioned the designer of this piece who, who sold the rights to Danuvia in the first place, and that was uh, Robert Vorosh, I believe, roughly how his name would be pronounced, Hungarian, but living in Germany at the time. And so his first patent that was granted in 1989 was a German patent. And the first production gun was 1994. Um, and as far as I can tell, they were, this thing was only produced sort of in earnest, as it were, for, for a couple of years. Um, only between 150 and 200 made, hence our low serial number. So we didn't actually get in that early on the production run. Serial number 101 is getting on toward the back end of the production of this thing. Now, I think if, um, well, you won't, well, you won't get one from Danubia. The rights were sold to a company called Intermodal in 1998, um, but if you want a number of these, I imagine you can contact them and they will uh, put it back into, into production. Um, they're relatively rare uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, we're fortunate to, to have one. Um, as far as its effectiveness goes, it, it's kind of an open question. The manufacturer or the original manufacturer claimed 5,000 rounds, but I don't know what that means. I don't know if that's mean rounds between stoppages, mean rounds between failure where the gun actually breaks, 
over what period, in what conditions, I don't know. Um, so it's a, a bit of a marketing bit of information there that a gun fired 5,000 rounds without serious problem. Well, that doesn't really help us in, in assessing its effectiveness. Uh, but in terms of its historic significance, it's rare. Uh, it's from Hungary, which has a tradition of arms manufacturing, but um, maybe not as prolific as, as some countries. So we're happy to have it for those reasons. And it's technically interesting for this particular take on a helical magazine that essentially has an internal drum. And as you push the rounds in, uh, each round is, is sort of just stacked up on the drum. It's about as simple as I think a helical magazine could be. Thanks for watching, everyone, as always. Um, don't forget to do the obvious YouTube things, liking, subscribing, that sort of thing. And of course, we have our social media accounts you can check out, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, and our website as well for any events that might be coming up later in the year. And of course, of course, our three sites. Please do come and visit us if you can, if you live in the UK or if you are visiting. Um, they are well worth a visit. Thanks a lot. See you next time.